Good morning. How are you feeling? Better. Oh, yeah? Mm-hmm. Not sick anymore? Uh, it doesn't seem like it. I feel like a normal person. We'll find out once I eat. I think you're really cute. I think you are really cute. I love your shirt. Where'd you get it? You look so... like a card game though? It is a card cool. based game, yeah. Okay. And then basically to do damage, like you're setting up your spells, your minions, etc. When it gets to the battle phase, you're actually rolling dice to try and see if you can get at the battlefield or if your damage is actually going to wind up going to okay. the other person. Fantasy wrestling from back in the day. I mean, you got that nostalgic feeling of, you know, great 80s, um, 70s wrestling. Uh, without all the new stuff, uh, and it's all fantasy based. So all the teams are based off of fantasy characters. Um, so you normally have clans of casinos together battling each other, but you can build any team you like. Um, you can play teams against teams. You can play individuals. You can play tag teams, and you can even do like an all for one and have like ten guys get together, each one being one guy, and just go at it. It's great. Beer and pretzel game. How long does it take to play? How long does it take to play? Once you get the rules, depending on the team, a team normally has two more guys in this. Um, you're looking about 20 to 40 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's not bad. But the whole point of the game is to knock an opponent and throw him out of the ring. Uh, you got five turns to do it. Is that the book that you get for it? Yep, that's the book you get for it. All right. And it's available now. If it's available get it. now. The two-player set, which is everything you see here except the board, and two more models per side, is fifty dollars. It's a really good deal, and it's a very for a hundred dollars you can get not just the, the the beginning starter game, but you can get enough models um, to to fill out ranks and just do like you do a whole season. You do a whole season. You could do. Um, drafts if you wanted to. I mean, there's a lot of cool things you can do. Very cool. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. So, Derek, we just ran through the entire exhibitor hall together in an hour. Yep. What is your impression? What Did you see something you liked? What did you think of it this year? I figure we'll go back and dig through the bits box. But I picked up the thing that I really wanted to get, which was Shadowrun. I grabbed that yesterday. Um, most of everything else, I think I already have. was definitely interesting it was like cosplay 101 and I was expecting it more to be like a discussion about um, you know more formally about this is what cosplay is here's how you can do it this is sewing this is what foam is this is what warbler is these are different techniques you can use here's some examples of things and it was definitely more of a demystifying cosplay you shouldn't be scared to try cosplay panel um, and discussion. Uh, a lot of people shared personal stories of cosplay and it was more of a, you shouldn't be scared. Everybody can cosplay. It doesn't matter what size you are, what race you are, what shape you are, or how good quality your cosplay is. And I was looking for something a little more technical. I just checked out the quiet room that they have here which is an interesting setup and I don't think necessarily really works for the purposes intended um, I think it shouldn't maybe the name for it isn't right maybe it should be more like low sensory room I guess um, the room has chargers in it and 
and some books and that's about it and then some signs about phones and stuff like that but the room is very bright it's got the lights on so it's not like you know if you're looking for like a sensory low um, i recommend having the lights off also you are allowed to play quiet games in that room um which i don't think is needed um origins is big enough and doesn't quite fill up the entire convention center center in the space that you can find a quieter area of the convention center to play your games in. I don't think you're necessarily, it doesn't require a quiet room to play quiet games and still have a quiet environment. I think the quiet room should be there for those people who are undergoing sensory overload. So I, I my recommendation or what, the way I would set it up is to have no lights um, or at least like just some night lights, but really turn off the lights, dim everything down the front door was still open so anybody walking past and talking and stuff like that you can hear and you can see them move and stuff like that and um, nobody was playing games when I was just in there but I would discourage people doing anything active so no coloring and no games and if you're gonna be using your phone I would recommend dimming it and then the other thing is it's right next to a room that is the wall separating it from the next room is like one of those thin slide walls that could potentially make the room bigger and there was a panel going on next door so you could hear not very loudly but you could very clearly hear the discussions happening in the room next to the quiet room um, which isn't ideal I mean it's not it's probably not where I would go for a sensory download I would just go back to my hotel room and put out the blinds and put out the blinds and put on an eye mask and stuff like that and hide from the world for a little bit strategy game where the goal is you're trying to be the person at the highest point by the time the game's over it starts off with these two oh, one guy just rolled underneath oh okay. that's okay okay i've been happening all day <laughs> these two larger neutral blocks go in the middle of your playing area and then all of the players it's two to five players take all of the other blocks and then randomly place them around so these two are completely covered does it work well at two it, this is definitely a game where I think the more people it plays, okay. the better. So those two guys I don't know if you just saw were playing too, uh -huh. and they they seem to enjoy it. Okay. Um, but definitely like four or five, three, four, five is where it's going to be at the best. Um, and so you randomly place these all over, so these are completely covered. The only rule is that you cannot have any overhanging over empty space. Okay. okay? Otherwise, they can be placed orthogonally any orientation that you want. On your turn, you get to move up. The only rule is that your player can only go on surfaces that are your player's color okay. or the neutral color. And if your player is tall enough to see over the edge, okay. actually have eyes, that's a free move. And you can keep going until you can't go any further. Okay. Now let's say this block wasn't available and I wanted to go on this, this neutral colored space. Yeah. I would need a ladder. Everybody gets a short and a long ladder. Your ladders just need to be at least as tall as you're wanting to climb. However, once you use your ladder, it's out for the rest of the game. So these are one-time use per game. Oh, man. Everyone also gets a uh, blocking disc. This is also one-time use per game. It can get placed on any unoccupied block. What it does, it prevents anybody from being able to climb onto that block, from being able to use that block or build on that block okay. for the whole round. So once you're, it's back to your turn, it comes off and it's out for the rest of the game. Okay. So usually the game will kind of start out with a more uh, shorter, kind of wider base. Yeah. As you build up, a lot of the blocks get hidden, they're less available. That's where a lot of the strategy okay. comes in. Um, eventually it's gonna get to a point where you're unable to move up. Once everybody in a row does that, it's called a pass. Once everybody passes, uh -huh. the game is over, whoever's at the highest point wins. It's really, how long does it take to play? Um, I, I think the box is 45 minutes. It's like 30 to 45 minutes okay. typically. What kind of players do you think would like this game? Is there a certain type of like, it's, it's probably not a Euro gamer. Right, right. So I honestly think that this is a game where it's good for everybody. Um, it's got the physical aesthetics of it and yeah. a very pretty eye-catching yeah. game. We have a five-year-old at home, a two-year-old at home. They both like they, to just play with sure. the blocks. But it's also good for the people that really like the strategy games because there is still more of that strategy. It seems really simple at first. The rules, the getting the hang of it is very simple. However, the strategy really comes into play. And you see that as you get further into the gameplay with the blocks becoming less available. And, and kind of seeing the visual, visualizing the orientation of how yeah. you want to place those blocks and 
and make sure other people aren't able to move up as well. And you're collaboratively building it out at the start, right? Are you Correct. taking turns? Correct. Stuff? No, okay. we just, everybody just kind of... Because like, I was looking at my side and I'm like, I did not set the side yeah. up. Oh, no, that would, not be, that would not be good. Uh-huh. Yeah, just kind of briefly. I was just interested. Yep. So everybody, so, yeah. so and that's why you also make sure nobody knows their player color. Because oh. if you know your color at first and you're kind of like, oh, It's I the idea of like, one person cuts and the other person gets to choose the piece. Right, right. Going to my LARP improv event. Um, I've only been in one LARP ever, and it was like five, six years ago. And it was with a group of people that clearly were a LARPing group that always LARP together in that group. And it was a public event at a at a convention, but I <laughs> I got like the cliffhanger rules of how it works. And having played an RPG before, obviously I play a lot that was really helpful but I kind of feel like if anybody were to walk into that never having played a, in a LARP or an RPG it would have been really scary and not super fun so I'm going to this class to so hopefully get more of a primer because I know the RPG stuff and I don't know quite any of the LARP stuff and I'm I was kind of hoping that it would focus more on, on, on like, like a one-on-one -on -one class one-on-one -on -one class that would focus a little more on like here's how LARPing works, here's usually how you deal with this situation and that situation and when you get your character sheet, this is okay to do, but this is not okay to do. Here's what to look for on your sheet. You can just say I have abilities and stuff. You can interrupt the conversation and just use your ability or something like that. Like I had no idea what to do with my character sheet and how it was relevant and what was relevant and how to use that information. That's what I would like. I have a feeling that this class is more of an improv acting class about how to make your character come to life. And that's not really what I want. Um, so I'm going to check it out. It's a two hour class and I'm going to go to at least some of it and see how I like it. And if I like it a lot, I will say. If I don't like it, I can always just leave. I mean, you're never locked into an event. I mean, I would try to go to events that you're going to actually like attend fully. But if it's a LARP or panel or something like that, if you have to leave, that's okay. It's okay to be like, my time is valuable and I'm not getting out of this what I want. So hopefully it is what I want and I'll see. But if it's not, I got better things going on. I didn't feel much about this um, class that I just took and it was interesting it wasn't exactly what I was looking for or needed and um, it was definitely like an improv acting class and improv mini games like the types you get on whose line is it anyway like the dating game or the superhero game or something like that um, <laughs> but only like three other people showed up and I guess he had like you know space for 50 so I didn't feel like I could just leave and it was definitely interactive, which I also am not not quite what I was looking for. I had fun, but the interactive part definitely put me on the spot a lot and it takes a lot of my energy and it soaks a lot of my energy, which I didn't have, but I don't know. We'll just soldier on. It was good. I would recommend it to anybody who's looking for that, but if you're just looking for an intro to LARPing, it might not be exactly what you needed, but it was good. Having a tea party, yep, and uh, she's got to have party games, yeah, and she wants to build type traps. So each player chooses a different skin of type trap. So okay. I have sheriff and gentleman and pirate, wizard, regular type trap. The goal of the game is to get a hat, two arms, and wheels, all matching the skin that you've chosen. Okay. 
Uh, in order to do that, on your turn, you can play an action card or you can attach a part. You can attach a part to any of the plant trap bodies. So you can attach the correct part to your uh, body, or you can attach the wrong part to your opponent's body. Okay. The only way to get the parts off is to use uh, Bring the Pain or New You. Bring the Pain just punches a part off to your Clap Trap. And New You takes all the parts off and lets you uh, uh, just start over. Okay. There's also some bonus action cards. Some of them do good things, some of them do bad things. Uh, swipe and Party File. So Swipe, you can take a card from another player. And Party File, you can uh, stop any card from being played. Uh, you can take a spin to get some cards off the top of the deck. Or you can dumpster dive into the trash to get a card you need. This is how I okay. But in the end, the first player to get a hat, two arms, and wheels, all the same match. Sure. Uh, to win. Sure. The uh, turns go build, discard, draw. So you can build, so you, that's attaching a part, playing an action card. Then you discard any number of parts that you don't want to use, as long as they match type or skin. So you can discard two arms or two pirate parts. So there's a bit of a sort of part matching, set matching type of thing. Sure. To help you get more cards. Uh, it's two to five players. Two players, like 15, 20 minutes. Are these basically all the actions? Yep, this is all the actions. So okay. all these bomb icons, these are bonus actions. Yep. Those can be played anytime. Those are like your interrupts uh, that happen so anytime. So the new you can do that as well? Yep, new you happens anytime. Okay. Yep. Uh, you're doing that by making payments to various secret agents and hoping that you have enough control over them in order to manipulate what they do. You're okay. competing with these other people who are going to put money on those agents that you don't know how much they have or, or what they're doing. And... By doing that, you are also using the special abilities they have to manipulate the briefcase for the other people. Um, you run through all the rounds until you get to the very end. At the very end, you'll roll this die. When you roll that die, it's either going to land on blank or it's going to land on Dr. Solomon. At that point, Dr. Solomon, who is the spy master, wins the game. What that means is if you have the most money on Dr. Solomon, you are the winner. Okay. Outside of that, you win by getting the briefcase back to your home base. Okay, uh, so everybody seems to have these blind bids behind them, which is all the different agents. Yeah, so each turn you get four actions. Um, you can either make a payment. You can Making a payment is technically two different options for that. So, like, you can make a payoff to any of the agents for any amount, or you can pay off Dr. Solomon. When you pay off the agents, you can literally put all 30 coins onto one agent, or you can pay Dr. Solomon one at a time. Okay. The other option is to move an and, agent. And when, I'm assuming that when you say I'm making a payment, you don't say whether it's Dr. Solomon or anything else? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the other option is moving an agent. So what you would do is you'd pitch, I'm moving Spyglass to Odessa. Right? So when you do that, everyone has the challenge, chance to challenge you. They would challenge you by having money on Spyglass. So when they challenge you, do they just say, hey... Uh, I challenge you for one. Okay. And I would say, I challenge you back for two. And you'd okay. say, okay, well, I challenge you for four. And I'd go, well, I don't have four on that agent. So okay. I guess you have to And you need to have, have that much you on there when you challenge. Much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the fourth option is burning an agent. In order to burn an agent, you have to have paid at least five sovereigns to the assassin. And in order to stop an assassination, you have to have paid at least five to the assassin. So, like, if I had five on any of the agents, I'd say, I'm burning this other agent. You would have to have at least six to stop me. Uh, on, a, on an agent on, that's in the same on, space? On the agent that's doing the assassination. Okay, so, so basically you're saying, I have five on Spy yellow, guys. and I'm going to burn red. <laughs> Yes. Okay, and then and, uh, they somebody else needs to have more on you six on yellow. On yellow to stop them from happening. Are, so, which locations are the final locations at the? Ah, uh, yes, Moscow, Athens, Glasgow, and Algiers. Okay. Cool. Yeah, yeah. it started in 1937. The game was originally made in 1937, and uh, went through a couple iterations before Restoration was like, let's make this, let's make this again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'm a big fan of the restoration kind of ethos. So. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. How much was we were told? Awesome. Probably for now. Yeah, of course. Wait, so what happened? So when, when we uh, contest yes. a game uh, using both hidden information and public information, okay. um, so you are trying to decide or figure out who is actually coming to the court this year. Um, and it's a bidding bluffing game where you're going to uh, bid on the person that you think is going to be there, but be careful because you could be overmatched by someone bidding twice what you have.
playing cards from your hand to progress the story. Uh, so you're playing these scene cards here. Um, each of the scene cards will have a different um, like question or problem that you will have to work through and uh, you'll play your tokens here to vote on what you want. Some of them will have special effects that go into play, like this one where uh, if you guys match on your answers, then the person who played the card gets plus one and the partner gets plus three. If you didn't, then uh, you guys both lose points. Um, so you're just playing through them, progressing the story, and uh, you, there's three chapters to the, the story. There's different stories in the game. It's really fun. and how you liked it? Unknown Armies. Yeah, it was just a, it's a modern occult game. Uh, really like a new version that came out in the 90s. Um, new version was on Kickstarter recently. And it was a lot of fun. Got to play it from some people. Uh, one of the game designers at Atlas Games ran it. And there was a small group. It was in the big hall, so it was a little bit loud, but it was still fun. Well, so Unknown Armies itself is about like uh, really obsessed People right. kind of like on a street level um, modern occult game where you're obsessed with this thing um, and you have different like weird kind of strange magic powers and the adventure we were uh, it's a free RPG day adventure from like a year or two ago and we were summoned to kind of go find this person who'd gone missing turned out that she had broken into like three parts uh, we had to find the three parts reunite them and then go like deal with a demon and I played a veteran whose magic was all around uh, her gun and the second amendment so uh, it worked out pretty well hey Derek where are we going now and what are we going to go do we're going to go get stuff to run the alien RPG so, uh, what, what about the alien RPG I'm going to go run it and some of our friends are going to play it because it is up for pre-order, and if you pre-order it, you get like a preview uh, PDF. So we're going to give it a shot and see how it plays. Also, just a casual examination, uh, there's something a little bit wrong here in that his arms are a little bit too long and you can see uh, the compression suit has a number of rips and tears in it mm. as if it was pulled forward or stretched forward beyond where it could be. That's cool. So, not long like in human long. Like oh, inhuman, like not not proper human clearance. Uh, I would like to you to take one stress. <laughs> I'll be like uh, <laughs> slightly less than my jubilant usual jubilant nature. Uh, Rai, uh, you owe me some money. You want to talk about the game we just played? Hey, sure. You want to do that again? No. <laughs> Uh, so we just played, or I just ran, um, like the preview for the Alien RPG that's coming out later this year. 
Uh, so we had like a cinematic preview. There's like a one-shot pre-generated character, stuff like that. Uh, it went really well. It was a lot of fun. Um, we only got through Act 1, uh, but that was where like the, the shit hit the space fan. And I think it was good enough that almost everybody stuck around to talk about it for like an hour afterward. Uh, so yeah, I think I think people were pretty into it. How excited are you about it? Do you want to try it again? Uh, I do? definitely want to play again. Like I think a lot of the people that we played with were from the Seattle area, and I think we were talking about uh, like continuing or playing again back in Seattle uh, to see what happens afterward. Uh, so I think people were pretty jazzed about it. I'm excited to see where it goes. There, you know, we we didn't get to see all of the elements. None of the player characters died, so obviously it wasn't a full alien experience. Um, you know, we just got to see the beginning of the horror, so we have to come back for more. Can't just stop there. I love you. I love you too. Good night. Good night.